So now we're going to kind of talk <clears throat> about what's happening at the upper elevations. Um, we talked about the fact that, oops, let me go back. We talked about the fact that um, we can think of global circulation of air in terms of, of both hemispheres having a Hadley cell, then a feral cell, and then a polar cell. But kind of on top of those cells, we have these um, uh, westerly wind at upper elevations. Now, when I say aloft or at upper elevations, it's kind of tops out at the tropopause. These we talked before, uh, remember the term geostrophic wind? That is what we're talking about here, where basically it, um, it is, is a westerly wind, and it basically follows uh, between isobars, and the isobars at upper elevations are kind of lined up with lines of latitude. Now there is some wiggle, some kind of meandering, and we're going to talk more about that here in a minute, but that's geostrophic wind. And just a little bit about that, remember we said that wind speed increases as you go up in the troposphere. Now as you enter the stratosphere, the winds begin to kind of decrease. And remember, the reason they are westerly up there has to do with actually, if we start at zero degrees latitude or the intertropical convergent zone, we have our warmest air. And we said warm air tends to kind of be a low pressure. But here, let's kind of think about warm air kind of fluffing out. So up here, if we look at the pressure and we compare it then to our poles, Poles have uh, uh, cold air at the Earth's surface, and of course that's going to be a high pressure. Now it kind of squeezes down, so basically it, the molecules are kind of sparse up here. So aloft we have a low pressure at the poles, and aloft we have a high pressure, relatively speaking, at the equator. So this is the pressure gradient force, PGF, pressure gradient force aloft, that creates R with deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere, it creates our geostrophic wind. And it is a westerly wind. And it looks straight here, but there is a little bit of meandering. Speaking of meandering, we can talk about these jet streams. And there's each hemisphere has two jet streams. The polar jet stream is stronger and more important to us than the subtropical jet stream. But what a jet stream is, is it's a, fa it's a tube of fast moving air relative to the air around it. There are, are stories in, um, I think I've got a YouTube video uh, for chapter seven under miscellaneous YouTube videos about, um, for instance, um, somebody who's trying to fly in a, here's my rendition of a balloon, weather balloon, not weather balloon, but some, a hot air balloon trying to fly around the world in a hot air balloon, they are counting on the jet stream to get them around quickly. Okay, so it's a fast moving ribbon of, of air. And this particular video I'm thinking of, actually sometimes there are breaks in the jet stream and it kind of stops here and restarts there. It's not always that kind of ribbon you see here. It's not, well, it's about a mile thick. I was going to say it's not very thick. That seems kind of thick. Um, let's see, and this is how fast it can move. Now they do relocate. Uh, they're, they locate seasonally. What we're going to see is both of these jet streams are actually in the feral cell, but they're kind of um, butting up against the Hadley and the polar cell. So I'll see what I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. So why do we have this fast moving air? It has to do with clashing of surface temperatures between, for, for the subtropical jet stream, we're gonna see that it's a clash between the Hadley and the feral cell. And for the polar jet stream, we're gonna see it's a clash between the feral and the polar cell. Okay, so here we go. Here's our two jet streams. Let's see, tropopause, Hadley cell, feral cell, polar cell, subtropical jet, and polar jet. So did you get all that? So this is our, you know, our, uh, our pressure gradient force. We talked about uh, wind aloft has a uh, uh, high pressure aloft over the equator and a low pressure aloft at the upper latitudes. And so this is gonna create our, um, our westerly wind 
But in the meantime, you can see that here is the polar jet stream here. Uh, and actually, we call the clash of the where the feral cell and the polar cell clash, we call that the polar front. And so kind of nestled in the feral cell is that polar jet stream. So you're kind of looking at a cross section. So it's a ribbon of fast moving air. Um, and like I said, remember we talked about how the intertropical convergence zone wanders north uh, in July and south in um, January. So that's kind of um, everything would wander, including the jet streams. Okay, so uh, looking at the polar jet stream, like I said, it is the the most important, I almost said least important, it's the most important, and it wanders seasonally. Um, in the winter, it's stronger, and in the summer, it's weaker. And let me just go ahead and put both of these up here. Here's the location, generally speaking, in the summertime of the polar jet stream, and then here it is in the wintertime. That seems pretty far south, doesn't it? So you can kind of see if we are about here, you know, we definitely can be influenced by the polar jet stream. It can help bring down um, cold air and bring up warm air. So the subtropical jet stream is not as important to us, but it can actually in the summertime be a player in bringing warm, moist air to us. It's generally located where the um, the Hadley and the feral cells meet about 30 degrees latitude. This is 25 degrees, but remember that kind of wanders. It's generally weaker than the polar jet stream. And just to kind of remind you where it is, there's a subtropical jet right there. <laughs> 